He's a former Bass Nation national champion, a six-time Bassmaster winner, and now a two-time Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year from Rathdrum, Idaho. The prodigy, Brandon Polnick, joins us this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I'm Dave Mercer, and welcome in. All of you are welcome, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. Here's where we all get down every single Wednesday. Um, put a little hump back in your hump day, and um, I hope you're having a good week, no matter where you are. hope you're catching lots of fish. Um, it's a freaking Big show this week, and it's kind of my job to say that all the time. Um, to get you, this is what they call the hook. This is where you're trying to hook people in to make sure they listen. I'm horrible at it. I should be faking drama and all sorts of stuff. That's how most successful YouTube channels do it. But because of you guys, I don't need to do any of that stuff because you guys, we passed a hundred and fifty thousand YouTube subscribers this week, which, um, is unbelievable. I mean, this is the 77th episode of this show. And when we started this show, there was 35,000 YouTube subscribers on this channel. Now 150,000. Thank you. Honestly, um, thank you all. Keep the grow going. Be a pal and tell a pal um, about this little show. And speaking of pals, I get to have one of my pals on this week's show. Um, and this is going to be a, a good one, um, just simply because um, this guy isn't just an incredibly accomplished angler. This guy is one of my best buddies and a guy that I've known since he showed up literally on the Bassmaster scene. And um, it's awesome to see what he's able to accomplish and what he's been able to accomplish, not just Trophy wise, sure he's a two time angler of the year. Sure he's won six events. Sure he's a former Bass Nation national champion. Sure he's a member of the Bassmaster Century Club. All of that is very impressive. But I I think he's more than that. You know he is one of those anglers that's pushing to make it better always. And um, he's one of the anglers that a lot of anglers look up to. He's a guy who if you see him doing it, a lot of anglers end up doing it. So. Um, He's just a real good influence on this freaking sport, and the world needs more like him. Without further ado, let's bring him in right now. He is a former Bassmaster Century Club member, a six-time Bassmaster winner, a former Bass Nation National Champion, a two-time Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year. We pulled him from the woods of Rathrum, Idaho, to spend a little time with us here this week. The reigning and defending... Progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year, Brandon Polnick. Brandon Polnick, what's up? Oh, just yeah, another another day at home. It which feels weird uh, to actually be home, but it's been a few days and it's kind of nice. Relaxing in Rathrum, Idaho, or not relaxing, dude? Like I've seen yeah. some of the you, you and Carl have been hunting and. Um, I used to make fun of people who've hunted in tree stand. Not make fun of them, but be like, yeah, I do something different. And I'll be honest, I just wrote it off as whatever. He thinks it's different what he does, but he's still hunting. I saw Carl's story and the, the mountain that you're basically traversing. What you do is very different than tree stand hunting. Yeah, it's not even, it's not even close to the same. Um, you know, I would say... On average, we walk 10 to 12 miles a day on average, um, and it's not flat ground. Like, very rarely is it flat. Most of the time, you're side hilling or you're going straight up and down, and it's, you know, angles like this. Sometimes you're trying to step, but you have to grab the brush to actually be able to make a step. Um, so it's, it, it's incredible, the country that, those animals live in and they do it 365 days a year, uh, you know, in crazy weather conditions in the snow. Like I've seen giant bull elk 
walking where their bellies are dragging in the snow and they're just walking along like it's just another day in the park. What happens? It, <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like a herd of elephants when me and Carl try walking through that stuff. And somehow with a massive set of antlers, they can walk through there like a ghost and not make a sound. It's crazy. It's like a moose. When you see a moose it, it, in yeah. the swamp, like how quiet they are, like when they yeah. run and stuff, it, you hear all the noise. Like it, it's like a freight train running through the forest, but it's crazy. Like how quiet they are, but I guess it's their life yeah. is kind of like the walking dead. I mean, they try to eat and not get eaten. That's <laughs> basically their goal every single day. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty much a shad. Yeah, like a shad. A shad of the, yeah, like a shad in the water. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, they're, they're much larger, and everything's trying to eat them, though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But when you're hunting, where you hunt, I would feel like something was trying to eat me. Like, oh, uh, that's I, also a possibility. <laughs> yeah, there. I'm. One of the other days, we were tracking some elk, and then all of a sudden just there are some cougar tracks and now Ooh. there is a cougar tracking the elk that we're tracking. And, uh, I mean, that can be an eerie feeling and I've had it where you circle back on your own tracks later in the day and there's cougar tracks in your tracks. And so then instantly, you know, you're doing this, like looking behind your shoulder and I've had, I've had a few cougar encounters, um, uh, black bears and stuff. I haven't had a, close grizzly encounter i've seen grizzlies but i haven't had a close grizzly encounter yet they're Dude. they're another level oh yeah dude so you've had a few encounters like like how close of an encounter um i don't remember how old i was i was i was in my teens and me and a couple buddies had actually fished this trout stream like just walked the stream and fished our way up and we we're a couple miles from camp. And then we just hop on the road and walk the road back. Well, we came around this corner and there was a mama cougar and her two kittens, which were not like cute, cuddly kittens. These were <laughs> like yearling kittens that could still kill you. Mm. And, uh, one of them took off like down the bank into the brush the mom and the other one stayed there for a while. I would say, I don't know, maybe like two minutes. And then the other younger one took off up the bank. And then mom just sat there, like crouched down in full pounce position with her tail just going. Chick, chick, chick. And I, it was the most eerie thing. It felt like hours and hours. And then my buddy started backing up a little bit. And, uh, and she would like creep forward to go chick, 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 and the like, creep, you know, still crouch down. And she was only probably 30 or 40 yards away. So it wouldn't have taken very long as she wanted to decide to take us out. And, uh, and finally, for whatever reason, like she just turned and just walked up the bank. And then we still had to walk like two miles back to the camper. So we just, we all had like the biggest rocks that we could find. And we're just <laughs> constantly looking behind us as we're walking down the road, just thinking she's going to ambush us. Ugh. It's weird the worst how, one. how critters like that, like animals that have no reason to fear you have a whole different swag. About them. Like I saw yeah. Wolverine once years ago and I, and I didn't even really realize how badass a Wolverine was when I saw a Wolverine. I've yeah. since been educated and know all about him. Very rare to see it. But when I saw this thing, I mean, it sat there and it looked at us and it it wasn't it was intimidating, but it was literally like. It, it wasn't yeah. making noises to intimidate us. It just like you it knew we have no shot if this gets to yeah. it. Yeah, it, that's. It's a pretty eerie feeling. And that's how the the grizzly bears are like around my house in Montana because they don't get hunted. They're not allowed to be hunted. They're completely different than the ones you would see like in Alaska and stuff because those ones actually get hunted. So a lot of times they smell human scent or like they know over time that that is dangerous and that there's a danger there. But down here that's not the case like it, 
they are the alpha predator because they we can't do anything about it. And so that's why every year you see increasingly amount of grizzly bears and an increasing amount of grizzly bear attacks. Like every year, someone around Bozeman, Montana, Yellowstone area gets attacked. At least one, if not multiple people. Have you never been able to hunt them there? Not. I mean, not that I've ever known of. Wow. I mean, I'm sure back before there was like actual regulations that had been hunted, but I mean, as long as there's been like a DNR or a fish and parks wildlife, like I don't think you have. Wow. Wow. I guess it just takes a few more attacks and more and more people go out into the woods and more and more people want to be remote. And um, it's crazy. You ever seen a Sam Squatch yeah. out there? Do you believe in the Sasquatch? Sasquatch? Oh, he's just like, I mean, there's probably one. There's probably one back there. It, do you right, believe in, in that? Oh, no. In all seriousness, do you believe in that or no? I, I don't know. I mean, I've never seen anything where I was like, oh, that has to be a Sasquatch. I've heard some really weird sounds in the woods. My brother swears that he's seen one once, Come if not on. twice. He swears by it. He's a full, full-time believer. Um, I don't know. I mean seen some weird stuff i don't know that i've ever seen a real live one well, what is your brother's what, you, your brother-in-law you say your brother like what, what step, is, this, is my stepbrother that brother what is the story like what i don't even know the full story i probably quit listening <laughs> when he started talking about it but <laughs> apparently he was elk hunting and and had seen one like walking and could hear it walking through the woods long yeah. arms <laughs> yeah kind of you know yeah pretty much your like typical stereotypical looking sasquatch wow they supposedly yeah. um one of the lakes that i go to uh i haven't been in a few years but i shoot pike shows at uh cree lake and it's in northern saskatchewan mm-hmm. and supposedly that is that's like a mecca of them. Like they're supposed like there's there's this spot. It's like the spawning. Gr- that's the spawning grounds of Sasquatch. I, I guess. I mean, it's St. Lawrence River of Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> it. Uh, but but they they told me like they said we'll bring you out to the island where everybody supposedly sees things. Or not an island, but it's a, like it's a remote part of the lake, yeah. and and we didn't have time. But but uh, my producer Nick and my he's like a weirdo with that stuff would love to find it and see it and all that. So we, we next time we go, we're sleeping out there one night. Like we, we, we didn't have time, but they told like, it was our last day of the trip. And they started telling us about the Sasquatch. I'm like, you wait until we're leaving to tell us this. Like, so, yeah. um, I you just find it to go back. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going it, it, um, Supposedly, there's a lot of stories, like a lot of people that left there, like went there to sleep for the night and did not stay the night because they heard noises and all sorts of stuff. I'm staying. I'll stay all night and we'll see how it works out. I find it weird how we used to hear about a lot more UFOs and Sasquatch before everybody carried a phone in their pocket that has a camera on it. I feel like the the visuals have become less since... I've seen some about. weird st- with some weird stuff that I that it looked UFO ish. I will say that UFO. So you do believe in UFOs? I mean, I I have seen. I don't know what you want to call it. It's an un- unidentified flying object. If that is the definition of a UFO, I have seen unidentified flying objects at night in Idaho. I don't know what they were. A gl- a glowing blob that slowly floats across the sky. What do you call it? It's flying. It's an object. It's unidentified. So it doesn't look like a plane. I can't, te- I can't tell you it's like a saucer shape or anything like that. But then you just see like a slow glowing thing floating <laughs> that's not not like shooting star up in the sky, but like within the atmosphere, you know, like within the Earth's orbit, not way out there it's just like slowly fading across wow i mean there has to be something you can't just can't look at all the planets and be like yeah we're the only one where there's i mean it might have been our own governments 
objects. I don't know, but it was some sort of unidentified flying object. And have you seen multiple or, or just once? I would say there's been like two situations where I've, been like, I've looked and said, what is that? Do you think that it, do you think that they have forward facing sonar? If you if if you oh. did, uh, yeah, you imagine what they, they have? Where do you think oh. it came from? Yeah, uh, it's it um, and, but it's like thermal night vision forward facing sonar. Yeah, that that's what I don't understand. Why there's always you always hear stories of abductions on UFOs and somebody gets anally probed. I'm like that. The, Doctors don't even anally probe you for anything anymore. I mean, I feel like if they can fly to our solar system, fly from their planet to ours and visit us, that they they don't need to probe you. Um, yeah, like what are they doing? They're checking your temperature. <laughs> I don't know. Like, me, hold on. Before we abduct you, we need to do a COVID scan on you first. <laughs> Oh, this is the worst angler of the year interview ever. <laughs> yeah, but th this is actually the conversations that you and I have. So this is great. It, it really is. It really is. I used to live near a nuclear power plant and there was always stories. Like when I was a kid. Um, yeah, explains it, a lot, but keep it, going. It really does. <laughs> um, but there's always stories that there was like something. But But like I said, since people started carrying you know, Bones. cameras in their pocket. It doesn't yeah. seem like you hear about it near as much, but it also could be like that. Our world is pretty crazy since phones and cameras came about in people's pocket. And maybe the, yeah. the aliens are like, screw this. Let's leave them COVID and get the hell out of here. Yeah. Humans are nasty. <sighs> they, they, we, 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 this, I don't know if this is our best time, but. It was your best time or one of your best times. Two time angler of the year. Is that yeah. sunk in yet? Uh, I don't know. I don't I don't feel like it has. Um I've had moments where it sank in. I feel like when you announced it on stage, it was such a uh like weight lifted off my shoulder, such a relief because there was there was so much time leading up to that moment yeah. that I had to think about it. And the longer you have, the more that pressure builds. So like the first one I won, I didn't really take the lead until way late in the season uh, where this one, I took it, you know, more than yeah. halfway or before halfway through the season. Um, so I had a lot of events to carry that. Right. And that weight continues to build more and more. Um, and then I think not knowing the point gap didn't necessarily help that because I <laughs> knew that I had lost a lot of those points at Oahe. And so it, there was like this thought in the back of my mind of like, how close is it actually? You know, like, is it one or two points? Like, what? I don't know how much room I had to slip. So that, uh, like that was a moment where it it felt real, but it it was such a sigh of relief that it wasn't like it was sinking in. It was like it was releasing, and uh, and then I've just had a few moments like since then where I've had time to stop and think about it, but I haven't slowed down enough. I don't think for it to really sink in. And then the other part of me is that. And this is just the competitive side of the way that I'm wired is like, as soon as I win that one, number three is on my mind, <laughs> you know, and that's not, I can't help it. Like, honestly, I wish I, I wasn't that way sometimes just so that I, I could appreciate it more than I do. And it's not that I don't appreciate it, but just the competitive nature of me is like, well, I'm not retiring. So like, it's not like this is like a, an end of my career thing, right? Like I still have a ton of room to improve. And so that part of me is like, well, doesn't let it fully sink in, right? Or it doesn't let you fully absorb how big of a deal it actually is. Do you think that's something that most successful people have? Like I, I, 
I mean, I do. I think that that never being satisfied that, you know, okay, let's go to the next thing. The next thing. It's not like you're, you're satisfied, but it's, you're, you're still driven. Uh, And I, I most really successful people, no matter what business it is that I know they have that trait. Well, it was, it's because you don't have an end goal, right? Yeah. Like you don't, you don't set this, this goal and then you achieve that and you just stop. Um, I guess it would be similar to where people think they're like, Oh, if I just make this much money, my life will be great and I'll be happy. But that that's never the case. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so like, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, Oh, when I win an AOI, like, I'll be good to go. But that's, that's not the case, right? Like if we're in a competitive sport, so you continually want to elevate that game. It's like when you've won two, well, then you want to win three and, and it'll be the same. Like if I win three, then I'm going to win one. I'm going to want to win four. Um, and, and honestly, I think where it would set in the most is if I had 10. <laughs> 10 because well because Roland's got 9 so you would be like the guy that has more than anybody god like, that's another I eight like that's, dude <laughs> I, that's I, eight didn't more. Say, I didn't say it was probable <laughs> but I mean I feel like I'm going to fish for at least like another 16 or 17 years so I mean you know what one every two years Good. A quick math, like. When you first started, your goal was to win a tournament every two years, wasn't it? Every two to three years. I remember you saying that. Oh, yeah, but I feel like, you know, personal growth is a good thing and you should continue to evolve your goals and step up. You know, that was that was before I had to feed a child and buy diapers, you know, I mean, you need you to be able to step it up a little bit. I don't I mean, that would be. That is so unlikely. That's probably more unlikely than winning nine events in one season. Uh, but I mean, why not? I have a, <laughs> somebody's, why not have a goal? Somebody's won nine angler of the years. Nobody's ever won all the events in this season. True. I mean, that's I've, the thing. Like I just, I want to win AOI with 900 points. It's <laughs> a great goal. That is a great goal. I mean, hey. it, like, it's so, I can't even win AOI and cat, a check every year. I don't think I've ever had a season where I've cut a check in every event. Never. Wow. But here I am saying I want to win all nine. <laughs> and and you got Brandon Lester who won two events this year. And cut a check in every event. And cut a check in every single event. Like, you know, yeah. made the cut in every single event. Did you hear about his nine pounder? No. Oh, it's the best luck ever for you. Um, he told me about it last week on the show, and it, it basically, it, and he he one hundred percent said Brandon Polnick is the angler of the year, should be the angler of the year. That's the right. Yeah. But he had, he had, and I and when he started telling me, I was like, I remember Lisa telling me that. But basically, he had a nine pounder uh. and he voted and he. Yeah, when he was I do fishing. know this story. It was at uh, Harris Chain. Yeah. Yeah. It sucked yeah. it in, but it sucked it in through its gills, not through its mouth. So it was hooked in the mouth, but it went, the line went through the gills. And yep. he called Lisa and she said, you got to let it go because uh, it's. It, it was at go. Harris Chain, right? It was either there or the St. John's River. Or Saint, I mean, I can't remember which one it was, but what's crazy about that is I remember when that happened, I think it was Harris chain. And then at the weigh in on day four, I talked to Lisa about that and how we, I thought we needed to change the wording in our rule so that that fish was legal. (laughs) Because he didn't like, like, I mean, I was, I'm on his side on that one. Like he got that fish to bite. Like he didn't, intentionally snag that fish so like they're the wording needs to be written so that if something crazy like that happens like you, you catch the fish like there's no way that <laughs> he can't 
force his worm to go through the back of the gills and down its throat and snag it. Like that fish tried to eat that and somehow through the power of how big that fish was, it went backwards. I don't know. But to me, I felt like that fish should have been legal. The way our rules are written, it was the right call. But I remember that now that I felt like at the time I was like, yeah, that probably should have been a legal fish. Yeah. Well, wow. or like the rule, the rule should be adjusted so that if that was to ever happen again, right, it's probably one out of every 10 or 12 years that ever happens. But if it did, like that should be legal. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's, I mean, it's, a, and that was, that would have been 16 places, hands down. Boom. And then, not maybe more because he misses the cut in that event, he said, yeah. where he would have made the top 10. It would have had a chance to, but it, he was not blaming anything on that. Like he, he just said throughout the year. And I mean, I know you throughout yeah. the year, but one thing before we get into your year, I want to ask you this about the points. You already brought it up. You don't pay attention to the points. I am tired of getting yelled at on Bass Live. You you don't realize how every time I bring it up, you got Zona and Ronnie and all this. Oh, yeah, as if he doesn't really check the points. Do you really not check the points? You got, they can ask anybody. Steve Wright didn't believe me either, and he had to ask Tiff about it. He was like, all right, Tiff, really? Does he not know the points? She's like, no, he really does not know the points. Like, I, I just... I it makes look. sense to me, but to them, it doesn't like to them. It's like, well, of course you check, but, I, but to me, that makes total sense. Just get the five yeah. biggest fish you can. Well, because it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It sounds so cliche when you say it, right? Like, oh yeah, you just catch as much weight as you possibly can every day. Duh. That's how you win. That's how you beat guys. But there is a noticeable difference. If you know what the point gap is, whether you want to admit it or not, when a guy knows the point gap, his decision-making process is altered because somewhere in the back of your mind, that is there. Yeah. You know, that is subconsciously there and you can't erase that. Like once you know that you can't erase it and it's there. And I know that because I've been that guy, like early on, I looked at points um, and it was, I remember I had a really, I had a really bad start to the year. And then we went to Gunnersville and I caught him day one and I looked at the points, you know, I was one of those guys. I looked every day, like, where am I at? Where am I at the standings? And, and it had moved me up and I was like, sweet. I'm inside the classic cut yeah. and I bombed day two. Mm. And I could, t- and I could tell there was a difference in my decision-making, right? Like I, I wasn't as gung ho. Like I wasn't pushing the limit of how much weight I could catch. It was like, okay, if I catch this, then I'll stay around here. I'll stay inside the cut. I started playing it safe and, and I ended up missing the cut and then I dropped and I was like, never again. I'm, I'm done looking at points. Cause I felt the difference. And since then I just, I haven't looked at points. Yeah. I mean, we've seen lots of, ang- I, I agree with your theory because I've seen lots yeah. of anglers too that lost angler of the year at the last event because they went into it with a 40 point lead and because they fished different all of a sudden because they had yeah. a 40 point lead. And um, yeah. it just seems like when you start changing and you start playing it safe, that's when it goes yeah. wrong. Your decision I felt made- it at Oahe and I didn't even know the points and I felt it at Oahe, like just knowing that I had a lead. I felt like I fished safer than I should have, you know, like I made different decisions during practice than I normally would have throughout the rest of the year. And it bothered me. It still bothers me. So why he still bothers you, even though you want to angle the year, like still yeah. today, it bothers you. Like what, what bothers On a personal you? level? Yeah. Just the fact that the, like I had a 66th place finish. Like I didn't want to finish lower than 26. Like when I, finished 26 at Florida. I was like, that's it. Like, that's your benchmark. Don't finish below that. And Oahe was such an ev- like event in my wheelhouse yeah. that to make that my worst finish, uh, it just bothers me on a personal level. 
you know, not making the right decision, like knowing that I'm a way better angler than what that showed on paper. Um, and I think knowing that I altered my decision-making process compared to what I did the rest of the year, uh, that like, it just bothered me, you know, not making the right decisions. It wasn't like not getting the $10,000 or even if I would have lost the lead, it was just that process that I changed that should have never been changed. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I was shocked. A lot of people were shocked after that one. I mean, do you think that now? Okay. So then you roll into lacrosse where lacrosse has been, like I, I've said it a few times on live. I'm like, this is Brandon Polnick's opportunity to exercise the demon of lacrosse because yeah. me and Overstreet recovered you when you got DQ'd for a calling across the state line, you know, a silly rule that isn't even a rule anymore. Um, yeah. You're calling your shots in that tournament. And, but it, but it also, you know, you left there, ended up winning St. Lawrence river. The rest is history. It's a big part of your story and a big part of, of what people know about you. But did you feel any of that coming to lacrosse after a bad one at Oahe, like in the back of your mind where you're like, oh, boy. No, but I knew lacrosse, like everyone wanted to look at it because they know that story of lacrosse. Yeah. And they don't look at the rest of my finishes. And I've really <laughs> not done that well. Like that, this last one was actually the highest I've ever finished at lacrosse. <laughs> uh and so it's not like it's been a great fishery to me. Um, I felt like I've always been right there where I could have had a really good event. The one where I got DQ'd was a really good event. I mean, it's not very often that it's easy. And that week was easy. Oh. Like it just, it was so much fun. Um, and, and going into lacrosse, I knew that that was, a possibility. Right. And I think the interesting thing with lacrosse is it's not a place that you're worried about getting bites. Like Oahe is just tough to get bit lacrosse. You know, you're going to get bit. The hard part is the difference between two and a quarter pounders and two and a half pounders or like two and a quarter pounders. You don't make the cut two and a half pounders. You make the cut, you know, and then two and a three, two and three quarter pounders, you're flirting with the top 10. Like that's, you know, and if you catch a five pounder, it's like a 10 in Texas. Yeah. Like there's just, so when those weights are so tight, there's so little room for air. And that's why, you know, having bites like that swim bait bite I had the first day and things like that, like why those are so important on a place like lacrosse. And that helps kind of build that momentum and that confidence going into the rest of the event. So day two rolls around and it looks like, oh, yeah. it's, everything's under control. I mean, <laughs> and on day one, when I saw that swim bait fish and stuff, I'm like, he's going to win angler of the year. Um, yeah. Just because, I mean, it was just, it was like, okay, this, he's got this under control. Yeah, like, it's a fishery. It's just that, meant to be. Yeah. Bites are normally not ever a problem. <laughs> you know, yeah. even the anglers that don't really catch them usually get a limit there. But man, yeah. it took you all freaking day. Did you? Did you even the most positive? You're one of the most per- positive people I know on earth. But did even you start to wonder, oh boy? Yes and no. Um, I say yes because I, I didn't have a limit. I didn't have a bass until I think 11 or 11.30. I caught my first one somewhere around there um, and didn't catch my limit until like 3.30, 3.45, something crazy like that. And so the no part of that is that it wasn't for a lack of bites. I was getting a ton of bites. I just couldn't put them in the boat. And so there was a part of me that just, I don't know, I had like this eerie – calmness like part of my brain was freaking out and then the other part of me was like it's gonna be okay like it's like it's just gonna work out the way that it's supposed to and just 
keep casting. And I was like what I told myself, like, especially when I got to four and I just needed, I knew that if I just caught one more keeper, I was probably going to make the cut. And I just kept telling myself, I'm like, just keep casting. And uh, I think the funny part was, is that I came to this crossroads where I had to make a decision of like, do I go run out into the river and fish some of that stuff, like stuff that I had practiced, I'd caught fish, but I hadn't fished it day one and I hadn't fished it yet day two. I'm like, Hey, do I run out there and fish that stuff? Or do I stay here where I know there's a population of fish and I just have to put one in the boat. And I made the decision that I'm just, I'm going to lock down in this area and I'm going to make it happen. And I, I made a small move to where I had another group of fish and I'm fishing, I'm fishing, and I'm not getting bit. I'm not getting bit. And I had caught two of my keepers uh, there earlier in the day. And out of the corner of my eye, across the bay, I see a fish blow up on the bank. And normally I would kind of wait and like, you know, kind of look and like see if I saw him blow up again. For some reason, I was like, all right, let's go. And I just picked my troll motor up and I went straight over there. And, uh, and just left where I knew the fish were. And I went over there and all of a sudden fish just start blowing up everywhere. And I'm like, here it is right here. And I was like, it's easy. Like they're just blowing up. Just throw your frog in there and they're going to eat it. Throw my frog in there. They eat it. I'd set the hook too early. I'd throw it in there. If they'd eat my frog. They'd be swimming off. I'd set the hook. They'd come up, jump, throw it. Like I don't, I must've lost five or six like good two and a half, two and three quarter keepers right there. They're blowing up on shad. And then the the craziest thing is that I miss all those fish and I get to where I saw that one fish blow up and I make that cast. And that fish is the one that makes number five that I weigh in. Like that, there were all these other fish and I kept losing them and losing them and losing them. And for whatever reason, that one fish that I saw blow up on the bank that caused me to go over there was the one bass that I actually put in the boat. I got it. I don't know. It's just, that's why Oahe bothers me. But at the same time, like it was just supposed to happen. Yeah. Was, it was a lesson that I was supposed to learn. And for whatever reason, I was supposed to finish 66. I don't know. Maybe the bass gods wanted bass master ha- to have a lot of impressions <laughs> on the website, make the story a little closer. Yeah. I don't know why. Do you believe in signs? Like, do you think that that fish blowing up was like a sign or do you just think it was something that happened and it would have happened whether you were there or not, but you were just in tune with the water enough to, to notice it and respond to it. Both. I think it, I think it, it was a sign and I think I was open-minded enough to listen to it and to follow it. That's the difference is like a lot of times I feel like there's always like a roadmap, right? That is out there, but most people are too focused or too locked into one thing and they don't have an open enough mind to turn left when their GPS says, right. You know, and I think that was one of those situations uh, where like I hadn't seen a fish blow up there all of practice or day one of the tournament. And all of a sudden they just start blowing up over there on that bank. I don't know. It just happened. I can't explain it, but it worked. Did you have those kind of things happen different times throughout the year? You know what I mean? Like just moments on the water where you were like, wait a second, this might be another angler of the year run. For sure. For sure. Actually, uh, Brian Evie, who spent half the year with you. Pretty much. Yeah. I don't, (laughs) I know we did eight days straight. 
I don't know how many days we did total, but I think it was like 15 or 16 days or something that we rode together this year. Um, And at Pickwick day one, uh, I already had a pretty good bag. I had like 18 pounds or something. And I had five minutes left before check-in. And I had this one school of fish that I'd found in practice that I hadn't hit all day. I'm like, I'm going to stop there. I only caught two pounders, but I felt like day one of the tournament, I, I kind of started to figure out how to get some of the bigger fish in a school to bite. And so I was like, well, I'm going to see if there's any bigger ones in here and see if like this theory actually works out. And I roll up to this school of fish five minutes left before I have to check in. And I idle over it. They're set up right. I throw out there. I catch like a three and a half pounder. It coals probably by three quarters of a pound or something. Throw it in the box. I throw back out there. I catch one that doesn't help. Throw it back. Throw back out there. Get halfway back to the boat. And at this point, I have maybe three minutes left. And I catch a six and a half. And it coals by like three pounds, you know, cause my next smallest one then is like, you know, three and a half, three quarter pounder. So I gained essentially almost four pounds in less than four minutes. And I looked at Brian and I said, that's the kind of stuff that AOIs are made of right there. Like those are the decisions that decide angler of the year or not. Uh, and no doubt, like, that was one of those moments where it was worth 16 points. Uh, yeah. You know, I did it at Santee Cooper, like day two, my bite wasn't happening. I kind of abandoned that bite and went to a place where I had lost a four pounder sight fishing earlier in the day. And normally I would have turned right. And I'm like, I'm just going to turn left. I'm going to make a hot lap down this bank. I've got an hour and a half left. And I don't go more than 75 yards and there's an eight twelve female and like a three and a half pound male set up. And I <laughs> catch the male and like, this, this is just the kind of crazy stuff that happened throughout the year that makes the difference. So I've, and I've never done this in my career before, but like, so I catch the male fishing from this angle. Well, all of a sudden in, you know, cause that's earlier in the year. So the sun isn't as high. The yeah. sun is lower. This will be a good lesson for everyone that I learned that I don't think I've talked to anybody about yet, except for maybe on my own channel. But so that sun is at a lower angle. Well, there were a set of pine trees there that I noticed when I'm fishing from this side that was blocking the light. And all of a sudden that as that sun moved and it was, you know, now it's four o'clock, three forty-five, four o'clock. I can't see that female like I could see earlier. So I just pick up the raptors and I push pull around and I spin around and I just keep push pulling until I get those pine trees over the bed because it created a dark shadow, right? And the pine trees are, yeah, you know, and they're like 50, 60 feet tall and they're way away. It's not like they're overhanging, but they created a block where I all of a sudden didn't have the bright sky glare on the water. And there she was. And I was like, huh, never done that in my life. But for whatever reason, I looked up, I saw the pine trees and I looked down at the water and noticed that they were blocking you know, or like it was darker and you could see better where the pine trees were versus the sun or the just clear sky. As soon as I made that angle change, then like five casts, I caught her. Wow. With 30 minutes left. Caught an eight twelve. you know, cold out a two pounder. Like <laughs> just, there are so many of those that happened throughout the year that were worth 16 places. So is that, is that, I'm probably going to say it wrong again. Is that limbic thinking? Is that, is that using the limbic part of your brain? Yeah. What, 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 what did we learn yeah. when we did? Yeah, a lot of that is, a lot of that's part of your limbic brain, right? That's, that's those, uh, 
those gut feelings that don't actually come from your gut. Um, but there are a lot of them are like emotion driven. So I, I think it's a, a cross between your limbic brain and your neocortex based on experiences that you've seen in the past. And that's why I say that fishing is also like a mathematical equation. I've been saying that a lot this year. And it's like all these variables that you plug into a computer system, right? So like if we had a system here, Someone's probably going to make a million dollars off this idea, but you like, well, <laughs> Bass Force kind of already does it a little bit, but like you would plug in all of these variables and then it spits out the output, right? Of like how you should go catch them, where you should go catch them. So the, that's why we always say like fish the moment or spend as much time on the water as you can. Like you can't be a fair weather fisherman because the more scenarios and variables that you see, the quicker that light bulb goes off in your brain, right? And so my goal um, as an angler now is to get to the point where those decisions become second nature. And I feel like that's kind of what those were this year, uh, where you, you don't even have to think about them or process them. You just do them, you know? And so it, there's like a part of your brain just subconsciously processing all of these variables. And then the more that you can do that subconsciously, it opens up your mind to be able to think like and pay attention to what's actually happening and focus on what's happening in front of you. Right? And those work together to like essentially build your deciding or your decision making. You're a little bit of like a young Rick Clun when I hear you I go guess off so. on these tangents. Like I guess so. I think about it a lot. Like I may go elk hunting out in the woods by myself and hike around, but then I think about this kind of stuff. You know, like like what is the stuff that actually makes a difference? I, I think the biggest thing that makes a difference with anybody is is t- is just repetitively doing something. You know what I mean? And repetitive yeah. it's because it always changes. But yeah. the, I mean, every time well, it's the thing that stands I, out. I, with explained every it, I think I explained it to Kumar this way of like, think about the first time that you picked up a bait caster and you had to process yeah. how you were going to cast that, right? You had to think about camera, okay, push the thumb button down. You had to think about when you were going to release and you had to think through that whole process. And while you were thinking about that, you weren't actually thinking about like where that cast was going to go as much or, or like what was happening. All of your attention and your focus was on how to actually make that cast. Well, now we've done it so many times, you know, hundreds of thousands of times that if I just look at a dock, I'm like, I want my jig to slide under that dock next to the second post back toward the back of the walkway. I just do that. Like it becomes muscle memory where you don't actually have to think about how to create that cast. And so when you get to that point, that's one less thing that I have to think about. And now I can think about, okay, how's my boat positioning? Where's the angle going to be, you know, and like, you, if you get a bite, why did I get that bite? You know, it just, the more things that you can make or get to that level where it's kind of subconscious or becomes muscle memory, then the, the better you're going to be, right? Because it opens up more space for your brain to process like what's happening in front of you. Do you ever think of anything else when you're competing, like during a tournament day, are you 100% focused on cat? I mean, you got to balance a lot of stuff. You're obviously yeah. <laughs> you're not a hundred percent of the time. So how, what percentage of time do you like, what, do you mind daydreams and floats off? Mm. Like, because an idiot like me, I'm perpetually always <laughs> like somewhere else, even though it seems like I'm here. I would say like 85 to 90% of the time I'm like in that moment, I would say. Um, but with that comes a lot of things, right? That's the cast, the retrieve, where's the camera guy at? Where's Kyle? Where's Sago? Like, you know, where's Dalton? Like 
I, I'm processing all of those things, you know, in my mind, but that's just part of it to me, you know? And so am I, okay, if I set the hook, where are these guys going to be able to get their shot so they can do their job? So you worry like, about that. Yeah. Like you think about yeah. that because a lot of pros I don't think do like they just try to get the fish in the boat, but you actually no, I'll think try to about get that. it. I'll try to get it to those guys where they can get a shot every time. Or like if I hook one and I'm in a position where I can turn the boat so that it's facing them so they can see, then I will. Cause they're trying to do a job. Like the fans want to see it. And to me, it's just, it's better for everybody. Yeah, no, it, it, I just find it, I think that it's the part of the sport that nobody even really thinks about. Like as far as fans and spectators and that sort of thing, yeah. they don't realize what you, like, I mean, just take any sport, baseball, football, doesn't matter. There's breaks, mental breaks those guys get. They get yeah. off the field and sure, they sit down and they think about what my next play is going to be or whatever, but they actually take that opportunity to think and relax and whatever where in fishing you guys balance so much and you probably yeah. more than many because i mean you're also producing your own stuff while you're out there um yeah is the goal to get to like a hunt you said 95 percent. would it be a hundred percent or is that impossible mm, no i don't think anything's impossible i i think i think it's possible but it's very difficult and you have to have an understanding of like what that scope is, right? Like what qualifies as being a hundred percent focused on that event. Cause like I said, there's like the media side of it. And, you know, so to be a hundred percent focused on just the fishing, it's nearly impossible, right? Because at some point in the day, there's going to be a pontoon boat that isn't paying attention that you're afraid is going to T-bone you or, <laughs> you know, something like there's going to be something that distracts you from that, you know, from that moment. Um, and so to be a hundred percent, it's possible, but it's, you, you have to have an understanding or like a little bit of grace with yourself of like what that actually looks like and what is part of being focused on in that event. Do you judge your success on the result? Like, can you have, can you not do well yeah. in a tournament, but still feel you did well? Or is it hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, for example, I was ecstatic to finish 26th in Florida. <laughs> I was livid mad finishing 25th at St. Lawrence river. Right. Because it's, it's what expectations you set for yourself. So my expectations in Florida are much lower than they are in New York. So if I finish 26th in Florida, well, that's way better than 105th. And 25th in New York or at the St. Lawrence river, that's my worst finish ever there. And so, you know, from a performance standpoint, uh, when you go into it with different levels of expectations, then that alters that thought process. Uh, another good example of that is in 2012, when I won bull shoals, I was super pumped up about it because I won the event. What bothered me was that I didn't perform day four like I did day one, two, and three. I just had a big enough lead. And I think I still had the first or second biggest bag on the final day, but I wasn't blowing it out like I did day one, two, and three. And that bothered me. Flipped the script and like a couple events later in green Bay, Wisconsin, I finished second to JVD, but I felt like in that event, I made incredible decisions and I just got beat the final day. But like I, I caught them better and better. And when day four came around and my water had dirtied up, the wind changed directions and where I had been catching them, it just, it got too dirty. 
and I was catching them shallow. And I just made this gut decision that I'm going to run and I'm going to run all the way up toward little sturgeon and fish this giant reef that I haven't caught a fish on in the last three days. But what I noticed is I would catch my fish early the first three days and then I would go up there. And I had noticed that in the couple hours I had up there kind of messing around is that I, I could tell the fish every day were moving deeper, right? They were like eight to 10, then they were 12 to 14, then they were like 15 to 16. And I made the decision that like these fish should be on this last reef, this 20 to 22 foot reef, they should be there. And I rolled up and I dropped my trolling motor and they were everywhere. And I, and I started catching them and I had one bass when I went up there and I think I caught like 21 or 21 and a half. And so even though I didn't win that event on paper, I won that event like personally, because I didn't just try to force something into happening or, you know, just stumble on my feet and get beat. Like I made the right decisions. I just got out fished on the final day. And one of the weirdest stories that came up this year, not weird, but I just thought it was like one of those aha moments where I was like, wow, that's really cool. And we were standing beside each other when it came out, when Jay Shakira won the St. Lawrence river and his oh, dad's yeah. there. And his dad's like, you know, when Jay was 13 years old, he made me go out there and follow you yeah. in green Bay. And it, yeah, was, it was that event. And it was literally 10 years Almost to the day, because I remember, I don't know the date, yeah. the actual date. I haven't gone back and looked, but I remember making Super a big close. deal out of Johnny because you won the one right before I cast. It's the best one to yeah. win. And that's what Jay did. did. So it's literally, yeah. how weird is that? Are you getting old? I am getting old. That, that's the crazy part is so I'm not physically old or like I'm not old <laughs> on paper, but I but because there is so many more young guys in the sport now, right? Like the average, I don't know what the average angler age is now in the elites versus when I started, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's 10 years younger it as far as be. like the average age. Like I think it was around like 46 when I started and I was 23. Like there was a pretty big gap between like a few of us that were younger and then like the majority of the guys. And so I started 12 years ago and I was pretty young. And so I'm still young or what I would consider young, but I'm older than a lot of the guys that are fishing now. Um, so I'm like this young old veteran, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of a weird place to be in, but at the same time, it's, it's pretty cool to see like I had some sort of impact at that time for Jay to, to ask his dad to go follow me yeah. and then here he is, uh, you know, doing something that I've wanted to do my entire life and catch a hundred plus pounds of small mouth. <laughs> Does it bother you? I was, I was actually about to ask you that. Does it bother you that there is two individuals on earth that have caught over a hundred pounds of small mouth bass and neither of them are you? <laughs> uh, it no. And yes. It, it doesn't it's not a thing that we're like like it actually bothers me like i'm super pumped for those guys it it was incredible to watch and i'm glad that i was there to like see it happen yeah. in person uh and i i don't think that that i don't think enough people realize how difficult that actually is to do and how rare the weather was that yeah. we had when we were there um that just does, like we'll most likely we will never see that again as long as i fish the elites like as long as we go to the saint lawrence river for the elites in my career i doubt we'll ever see it like that again as far as weather wise okay weights could weights could be great but as far as like four days of glass calm sunshine and that many fish are up shallow like that just doesn't happen. I don't think it was that calm when the glaciers carved the Great Lakes. I don't know. <laughs> no, but do you think that it'll – what's your take on next year's St. Lawrence River Tournament? I mean, it's a little later, so the fish should weigh more. And I know weather plays such a huge role, but I also feel like 
it doesn't have to be perfect to crack that hundred. Like it, 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 you, to, to have what we had, it has to be perfect to have 52 bags over 20 pounds on day one and all that. Yeah. But I think it can be broken again. Oh, if you were to ask me, or, you know, during the St. Lawrence event this year, I would have said, it's not going to take over hundred. Like it's going to take high nineties. I don't think it'll break a hundred because we were too early. The biggest bags I've always caught have been when I've went up there fun fishing in mid to late August. Like, I feel like that is when yeah. that, that place has the biggest potential to weigh over 25 a day. Um, and your best potential to weigh 30 plus. Like, I mean, that's to me, that's just the time of year where in those Northern fisheries, it's where you have kind of the longest window of stable weather where those fish get set up um, and they become a little bit more reliable uh, if that's such a thing with smallmouth. But I feel like to me, that is the best opportunity. Like you said, even if you do have less than ideal conditions uh, and the fact that we're launching out of Clayton makes it way more doable because it's only like, 12 or 13 miles to the mouth of the river. It's not 90. <laughs> uh, so, so like when you went out there, what was your win tougher because you had to run so far or. No, I mean, cause talk, talk who did it last year. How yeah, amazing he is he like, yeah, dude, dude, he had never caught a smallmouth bass <laughs> before joining the Bassmaster Elite Series. He had never caught a smallmouth bass, and he's so good. <laughs> he's already... It, like, everyone knows that he's good, and I still think he's underrated. I agree. I agree. Like, and I, just, I don't think people give him enough credit for how good he is. And I don't think people know how much work he puts into it oh. either. Dude, that... Every time I talked to him, he's like, oh, driving to wherever. I'm like, Tucker, that's like a 22 hour drive. I know two days of practice, then come back fish elite. I'm like, you're insane, but okay. But his results show it. You know, he, he puts in the time, he's incredibly consistent. Um, and he, I think one of the coolest things is that he will do everything in his power to not fish shallow. <laughs> he does not want to be within casting distance of the bank. And he will admit that like, he just doesn't even like it. Doesn't well, he spent, want it. spent a lot of years fishing from the bank in Japan. He's like, I got a yeah. boat. I'm freaking like everybody. When they first get a boat, they're like, I'm going out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, he's, he's one of the most amazing people. I know not just anglers, but people like uh, the, yeah. I've told the story a bunch of times. The first time I met him, like his wife, it was like a UFC interview. His wife was yeah. the translator. Like it literally. And yeah. now you watch him. He's one of the crowd favorites. He's, yeah. he's well, an amazing, I mean, amazing. Think person. about like, he's so positive and happy oh. that that's infectious, right? You don't want to go hang out with someone that's a Debbie downer all the time. You want to be with positive Polly, And that's what he is like you want to hang out with a guy that's like that. And so, um, and it, his innocence, right. I think is also infectious. Um, and it's, uh, it's, he's a really, really cool individual. Uh, the first time I met him was in Japan, actually at the bass or all-star classic. And he, he said he was going to fish the opens and he was going to make the elites. And he did. And he didn't fish a lot of tournaments before that. Like, I mean, he yeah. had fished some tournaments, but it, like, there's a lot of Japanese anglers that have come over that had a bigger tournament. I mean, he was a more of like, he explains it to me. I was more of a social media angler. Like he made yeah. videos and pictures and, and stuff. And, but he yeah. wanted to fish, but he didn't want to fish other terms. He wanted to fish the Bass Masters yeah. Cause that's what was on the video game when he was a kid. Um, it's crazy to me how like wh why the sport works out the way that it does. You know, like you bring that up where he was, he wasn't like this crazy well-known tournament angler in Japan. And then he comes over here and just crushes it. 
And then you've got Daisuke. Who is? Aoki, who is like one of the greatest in Japan, you know? And if you say his name to anybody over there that fishes tournaments, like they know who he is. And then he didn't have a, a year that showed how good of an angler he is. Like we saw glimpses of that. Like I'm so glad that he had the event he did at Chickamauga. Yeah. So people could understand how good he actually is. Cause the first time I s- stepped and like fished out of the same boat with him, I was like, no doubt this guy will make the elite. He is really way too good. Yeah. No doubt. I was like, he has everything it takes to make the elites. And, wow. and then he did. And I mean, I was shocked that he wasn't in at least the top 20 in AOI. I think he'll, he'll figure it out. And I think they, there's a lot of things that, you know what I mean? I mean, it's just his first season here and I think he'll, yeah. But what made you think he was that good? Like when you, when you fish with an angler, what do you see that makes you think this dude can hang? There's like, you just see like, the way they cast or the way they work a bait or, you know, their attention to detail. And like, you can just tell when someone has something just a little bit different, you can, you can see it, like you can sense it. And I don't know that you always can point your finger to it and say, it's oh, it's this one thing. Uh, but I just remember we were on Oneida um, and we were throwing jerk baits and there was a moment where I, like we were fishing perfectly in sync with each other, but not necessarily paying attention to each other. Like it wasn't on purpose, but our rods were moving at the exact same speed and like the exact same twitches. And, I, and it just kind of caught me off guard. I was like, I noticed it. I was like, wow. Like that's that. And that was where like, fishing is our language came from yeah because i couldn't speak japanese and he couldn't speak english but we could communicate to each other on the water without speaking a word like we could understand each other um through you know fishing and because we both had the same level of love and understanding of it that i was like you know and so when you can't communicate verbally but you can communicate with somebody like that i think that's what kind of was the thing where i looked at him like yeah this guy's he's really good you said love do you love what you do like do you truly love what you do no no i physically and mentally can't live without it um better answer and I, I tell uh, I tell high school kids that a lot, you know, or college kids that like, you know, what do I need to do to make it? I'm like, first thing you have to do is is that, right? Like, if you want to make it, you physically and mentally have to not be able to live without it, because if you just if you just love it, you'll get your teeth kicked in enough times that you'll learn not to love it, and so. If that happens, then you're just down this dark road of like never making it. But if you physically and mentally can't live without it, like you have to do it and all of your decision making process is geared towards this one goal, then that's the first step in being able to make it to the elites. And I have been that way my whole life. And like and just loving it's not enough because you lose way too many times. When was the like? I'm trying to think of like, did you have have you hit any real like? I remember season one, I guess your first season, but you still, you know, made the classic. And have you had any like, Mm -hmm. were you those driving home? Maybe I can't do this, or or was that never even an option in your head? No, I don't think it ever was. And I don't. Even when I was younger, even before I qualified, it was like, it's going to happen. Like in time, it'll happen. I remember sleeping in the backseat of my Dodge Dakota Sport. (laughs) Like I had to put it in four load just to get out of the boat ramp because I didn't have enough power. Like sleeping in the back of that thing, 
just thinking like, man, it's going to be awesome one day, you know, like, and, and I still think about those times, like just driving across the West by myself when I was 16 or 17, 18, like just, I don't know if many people have heard this story. There was one time I'm trying to think what year it was. Um, I was driving back home. Can't remember what year it was, but I was driving back home and I had to stop in Buffalo, Wyoming and sleep in my truck because I was waiting for a check to show up so my mom could take it to the bank and put it in a, my bank account so that I had enough money to get fuel to make it to the next gas station. Wow. And, uh, and like, I don't, I don't forget that stuff. Right. And you like, that's the kind of stuff that it wasn't ever a thought, right? Like it wasn't like, oh, I don't have enough money. Like I can't go. I just went and then <laughs> I would just figure it out later. Um, but those were, you know, those are all moments that every guy that's made it, I feel like has moments or stories like that, you know, where you just, you come to this crossroads and you're like, well, I guess I'm going to go fishing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like everything else takes a back seat. And, um, as I get older or like, as anyone gets older, obviously, right. Like you, you can change that and you adapt that, uh, you know, like obviously I have a wife now and an awesome, healthy little daughter, but so like, those are priorities, but that, I mean, I'm just going to say that love for fishing, even though it's more than that, like that, that doesn't go away. You just adjust of like your time and how you approach it. What is it like to be a dad for you? Greatest thing ever. Really is. Isn't uh, it? it is, is the greatest thing ever. Uh, it's super challenging sometimes. Uh, but I feel like a lot of times when it's challenging, it's based on our own comforts. Like to me, and we're pretty lucky because core is pretty easy for the most part, but to me, a lot of it is like kind of that perspective or those expectations you set, right? Like it's really not that hard to raise him right now. She's three months old. And like, if I set her down, like she stays right there, she can't run around. So like the first <laughs> part's pretty easy. I know that it'll get more difficult, but then it'll also like, there'll be some things that get easier, right? Like if something's wrong and she can talk, she's, she'll be able to tell me what's wrong where right now you kind of just have to guess. So like you listen, right? Like the cry is a little bit different when she's hungry versus when she's tired or when she's upset. And so you like pick up on these little cues. Well, that's no different than fishing. Right? Like you're, you're trying to pick up <laughs> on all these your little hundred <laughs> percent. Every parent does it. whether they know it or not. I just happen to be willing to admit it and know, it. <laughs> but like they have, there's like, a million apps out there to pattern your child, right? You're like patterning their eating and their sleep cycles and their poop cycles. I'm like, was it a dirty diaper? Was it just pee? Like <laughs> there's all that stuff out there. And so you're like patterning it to make sure that they're healthy and like in some sort of a routine. And uh, I think the coolest thing is that stuff that before I'd be like, ah, I don't feel like doing that. Like, I'm not going to take the trash out. I don't feel like doing the dishes. I'll do them tomorrow. You just do them. Like, you know, so like that stuff that's in really insignificant, that isn't the most fun stuff to do. You just do it now yeah. because there's something that is way greater um, that you're still required to do this level of work to keep going on through life, but you just do it because it needs to be done and you don't even, second guess or think about it yeah jerry seinfeld says success in life is is accepting the torture that is your life and and he and he and yeah. what he says is he's like but well, we don't really all i mean we're literally talking to each other on a video phone right now 
yeah. I mean, not too long ago, that was like jets and stuff. Like this is not going to ever happen. So our lives are not that tough, but we, your life's as tough as you want to make it, right? Like your life, you know, whatever it is, it's like, I can't eat that. I'm allergic to that or whatever. That's, that's tough, but you can eat like, you're not, we we don't have a bad, so it's just accepting whatever, whatever, whatever your torture level of torture is and realizing how lucky you are, I guess. I, I mean, I I mean, sometimes guys have legitimate complaints and sometimes guys' complaints are not legitimate. But I look at them and like want to just say, you do realize you you fish for a living. You've wanted to do this your entire life. And now you're doing it. So why what are you complaining about? Is it really worth complaining about? Some stuff, yeah. yes. But if you're gonna come with a complaint, come up with a solution also. And that, yeah. but that's the thing, right? Is like money is not a solution to your happiness. Like catching more bass isn't always a solution to your happiness. It's like you have to choose that happiness and it comes with your perspective. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. Like I know a lot of people that make a lot of money that really aren't that happy. And then I've seen people in third world countries that are extremely happy and they don't even have clean water or somewhere to go to the bathroom, but they are incredibly happy because of their perspective. Do you think your perspective is your biggest advantage in this sport? I think it gives me a big advantage, but everyone's capable of it. But I think that's true. I think think it's true in any sport. Have it like I, that's who you are. Like, I, I believe that if I met you in high school, you'd still have been a very positive. No. Yes, it, it is. But I, but I believe everyone's a product of their environment. Yeah. You no. Know, and so I was just blessed that I was surrounded by people that, you know, shaped me into who I am. Um, you know, I had influences from all sorts of different walks of life that formed my thought process, right? Or I've read books that helped form that thought process or research things. And, and so it's like, was I born that way? Maybe a little bit, but then I also had all of these influences, yeah. right? Like when you're a kid, that's like what me and, Tiff talked about early on is like a kid's not born and is like, Oh, I'm supposed to live in a three bedroom, you know, two <laughs> bath house. That's 2000 square feet. And like, they don't know that you're like, I just want to be with my mom and my dad yeah, and feel happy and healthy and safe. And if that's in a fifth wheel or that's at home or whatever, and a truck, like all of that stuff is just like sec. They don't know any different. You know, so they're just a product of their environment. And I believe because of the way I was raised is the reason I am the way that I am now. When I, and I've told this story a bunch of times, but the first time we met each other was before both of our first classics. Um, Mm -hmm. You were competing. I was announcing Um, (laughs) for those that didn't keep up. Uh, But I, I, I was so impressed with you the first time I met you. I'm sure you've heard me tell this story, but I I mean, I basically, we talked for a half hour, had a great conversation and it was a weird time for me too, because I was the new guy and there was people that I knew like Kevin and stuff like that, that would go out of their way to say hi. But there was a lot of like, you're the new guy. So there's a lot of people that I didn't know that, you know, I needed to make the effort. They weren't going to make the effort, but you like, you went out of your yeah. way to come up and introduce yourself to me and everything. And I, and I had done research on you and stuff, but I was so impressed by you that I went, I left our thing. I went to that production meeting, which my first production meeting, which I thought was a big deal. And, um, and I said, I yeah. met this kid, man. And I said, I don't know if he'll ever catch a bass because I mean, our, our meeting was in a coffee shop. You might've just been a good talker. Um, I said, but if he does, I think he's got every single asset that it takes to be a superstar in this sport. And they kind of, 
you know, laughter, but you know, whatever. A new guy. Yeah. Well, damn, did you ever make me look like I know what I'm talking about? But my question <laughs> to you is what what do you think that kid that I'm at 23 years old, 22, 23, whatever you were at the time, what do you think they would think if they could have looked in a crystal ball that day and looked ahead and said, Hey, in 12 years or so, you'll have two Angle of the Year titles, incredible marriage, a baby. Yeah. What, what, what does that 23-year-old kid think of you right now? Don't stop, I guess. I mean, You're uh, so relentless. <laughs> and, like, is it... Like, what is the point of saying, like, it's enough? No. You know, like, there's, like, you, like, you win two million, you win three million in career earnings. Like, it's, that's not, none of those things are the reason that I do it. And so that has never changed from the time I was eight years old to the time I was 23 when I met you to the time that I'm 34 right now. Like I never did it because I wanted to make a bunch of money. I never did it because I wanted the titles. Like, yes, you want all those things, but, and I probably didn't know this at the time when I was like 23, even though I can look back now and say like, it was the same was true that, then I just didn't understand it because I wasn't mature enough to understand it like I do now. But it was those, it's those moments when those things happen uh, that are the reason that I do it. You know, it's the, the feelings that you get, that emotion that you get when you win. Like when all of that hard work is rewarded. Like that's just a... Um, Like that just resembles the hard work, right? Like that's just an item that's handed to you that is like a symbol of all of the sacrifice that you put into it. And like when, when someone wins AOY, it's really not that year. Like that's a lifetime of work that goes into that. Like a guy doesn't just come in and he's like, oh, well, I decided that I was going to catch bass two years ago. And I, uh, I fished the Bass Nation. I made it. I won the national <laughs> championship, qualified for the elites, won the classic in the AOI. Like, it just doesn't happen. You know, like even the guys that come out of nowhere, like when I won the national championship for the Bass Nation, that was my seventh year fishing in the Bass yeah. Nation. It wasn't like it was just the first year I decided to do it. And so I think um, like knowing that is why it's like, it's never enough because I still have just a hard of a time getting off the water now because I want one more bite. But like when you're catching them, it's like, I'm never satisfied. I'm like, Oh, that was a great day. I caught enough bass today. I'm going to go home and, you know, I'm just going to eat some dinner at four 30 and relax on the couch and watch some TV. Never happens. Like two night, I think it was last night. Last night I got home at like eight 30. Cause I was out there on my home lake, like still trying to catch bass when the sun's going down. Cause I wanted one more bite. I just, I wanted to feel that one more time. Um, and that's never changed. And, uh, and so when it when you fish for those reasons, I think that that's what allows you to keep doing it. That's why Rick Clun does it at seventy six years old. Because it's amazing. He, he does it for those reasons. It's like that's mind blowing. I, I don't think I'll be able to do it like that. He does. Like the, what he does is not. It does not get the recognition that no. it deserves. No. Because it's not happening in any sport. That. Yeah, it's not happening anywhere in any sport. Like, I don't care where, I mean, no, to do it. He- at my age right now, at 34, I would be old 
in almost every other professional sport. <laughs> Nearly every other professional sport, other than maybe like golf and bowling, maybe. Nearly everything else, I'm pretty sure I would be old. Maybe not curling. I don't know what the average age of a curler is. Oh, but they, they, they can go. They can I, I, feel, I, <laughs> I feel like, uh, but like any extreme sport, Right, I wanted to be a professional snowboarder early on. By the time you hit 30, you were like decrepit old dude on the slopes. Um, like that's just – so to do it – and, I mean, points-wise, he hasn't had the greatest last couple of years, but he's still won events. And when you yeah. watch him fish, it's not like he's just lollygagging around, sitting in a seat. The dude's getting after it. Um, yeah, and it, but you hear him talk like he just he physically and mentally can't live without it. He has to continue to compete. So you say you don't think you could do what he's doing, but I'm pretty sure if you asked a 34 year old Rick Clun, he probably wouldn't have said he'd still be fishing when he was 76. True, but if you're still chasing True. that, I mean, do you think yeah, he'll ever know. retire? I don't know. I don't know. My goal is at 50 to try to be financially set up that I could retire. So then you can at least make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whether or not that happens, who knows, but that's just one more thing that like I set up early on that I thought about and I'm like, okay, make, this is your benchmark. Now make decisions based on that to try to make that happen. I think you're doing pretty good so far. I mean, I, I, it's been good. I know I talked you up in that production meeting, but I had no idea. I just, I just thought you'd be good. Um, you were a nice guy. <laughs> you just stick around a little while. <laughs> um, you bought something after winning, correct? Yeah. Would you buy a Ferrari, a I, Lambo? I, <laughs> no, no, that's what some people would do. They would, you know, go buy ridiculous stuff. And some people might think this is ridiculous. I think it's only going to gain in value. Um, but a buddy of mine, um, Seth Morris, who works for Meat Eater, his wife is an incredible artist. Um, her name is Kelsey. And I've always been a fan of her art. She does a bunch of like Western art type stuff. And earlier in the season, she posted um, a picture of this bison skull that her and Seth had found. And I've just always thought there was something like cool and majestic about bison. You know, like they're just this different creature, kind of archaic looking to me. Like they just represent like this old soul time that I love. And so they, they found this bison school and she was talking about doing this painting on it and painted it. And I was like blown away. I'm like, like I've always thought art pieces were really cool, but to me it had a story, right? Cause I'm like, what did this bison live through? Yeah. You know, like if it could talk, and it just had a tape recorder or like, you know, could just tell the story of this bison. What would it tell? And, uh, and so I was like, if you ever sell that thing, let me know. And she, and so she told me like that it may end up going into a museum, wasn't sure and everything. And so right before Oahe, uh, she's like, well, I'm going to end up selling it. Let me know if you want it. And I didn't really know. And I was like, and it, and it wasn't a cheap piece, which it shouldn't be. It's worth every penny I paid for it. But I told her, I was like, if I win AOI, I'll buy it. And then Oahe happened. I was like, oh, gosh, I really oh, need boy. that bison skull. <laughs> I really got to get that bison skull. So then I stepped it up at lacrosse. Uh, but the cool thing was, is that we have to drive right by her studio. So her studio is in Three Forks, Montana. And uh, it's on the way to our house. Uh, you know, it's like a five, 10 minute detour. So we stopped there and we were able to go to the studio, 
see her artwork. And then I was able to pick up this piece, which I actually have right here because we were talking about it before. So those that have not seen it, this is like, they figure it's a several hundred year old bison skull. Uh, and then it's coffee stained. So that's where it gets kind of its brownish look to it. And then she painted this incredible like white Buffalo painting on the skull of it and had a custom stand built for it so that it sits level uh, in my house. And uh, to me, it's just a, it's an incredible piece. And I don't know. To me, it's like I just look at it and like, yeah, that was worth it. You know, like you can buy random stuff, but that was cool. That's I got another piece, cool. another hey, piece what, here what? that I actually just got in the mail. Oh boy! Before what? No, before we look at this other piece, I want to because I don't think the video does it justice. What's no, no. her website or their website? Or did you know any of that so, info? Her name is Kelsey Morris. Um, it's K Ray Art Works, I believe, on Instagram is the actual her actual page. But that, yeah, it's K underscore R A E Artworks is her Instagram page, and you can go on there and see photos of it uh, that actually don't even do it justice, like it does in person but it gives you a better view of it than my blurry, you know, video screen on here. Okay. Are you going to tell me how much you paid for it or no? Uh, <laughs> you don't have to. I don't know. I no. don't know if she wants that out there. <laughs> okay. Let's know. not talk about price. Okay. What else we got? You know. have other things on your table of your ticket. Uh, well, yeah. So it's on my table because I opened it like right before we started this. Um, I just, this is the kind of stuff to me where I'm blown away because you get, like, I know how precious time is. And we were talking about this before we started that, like, time is such a, it's the most precious thing we have as humans. And so when someone spends time out of their life and makes something and then gifts it to me, um, or even, even if I buy it, like to me, that's like, that makes angler of the year feel real to me. I don't know why, but it's because I know that someone is taking time out of their life to do something for me. And that means a ton. And so this guy had sent me a message on Instagram and said he wanted to send me this thing. Uh, well, awesome. I was blown away when I pulled it out. And when I showed you earlier, you're like, does that have glitter on it? Yeah. Like, yes, it does. It, it has uh, almost like metal flake that you'd have in one of your soft plastics or something, but it gives it this like green sheen. And so it's, it's all wood burned it's all the dark pieces wow. are wood burned and then it's clear coated um and his name's patrick patrick tucker it's uh i think it's alabama burning or alabama wood burning is his right. i'll look it up real quick but it was like that kind of stuff to me is just really i don't know i think it's special that people by catching bass you have a big enough impact on somebody that they want to do something like that for you. Yeah, I think it's awesome, but I also think that you're pretty modest in what you do for people. I mean, I watch you at events and the amount of time you take with, and I think you've started this weird little tradition that's starting on the elite series <laughs> and you probably won't get credit for it. So I'm going to give you credit for it right now. But earlier in the year, there was a kid and you, to ask that kid to come in your boat and help you bag fish. Correct. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. now we got all sorts of pros inviting kids in boats to bag <laughs> fish, but I just think, man, like how cool is it? Not that yeah. it doesn't have to happen every time, but it's just like, you just think of all those kids with that experience. Like I got in Brandon Paul next boat, Seth fighters boat, whoever's boat and, and bag fish. It was, it's, it's, 
it's pretty cool how you guys, the memories and the things that you give to everybody. So well, I, I think, I mean, yeah, that's what's special about our sport, right? Is that we, I don't think there's any other sport that has that direct connection to the fans like bass fishing does. Um, and I, I, I feel like it's important for us to do that, right? You don't know when that next kid that like holds your bag is going to be Jay Shakurit that, <laughs> you know, tells you a story, right? Like there could be a kid 10 years from now that's like, Oh man, I held your bag at St. Lawrence river on day three. And, you know, and now here I am fishing the elite <laughs> series, like leading this event, you know, like you never know when that's going to happen or that impact that you're going to make. Right. It could be a kid that's, struggling with something at home or at school or something. And you have that impact on them that then has a lasting impact on their life. And that to me, that's something that's so easy. Uh, I don't even know why I started it, um, but I've done it really, gosh, like almost my whole career. Like there's kids around. I'll, I'll just see a kid and be like, Hey, you want to come help me bag my fish? One, it's not that easy to do by yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> like to try to hold a bag, reach in your live well, grab a fish, put it in there, close it, keep it shut, not dump all the water out and reach back in your live well and grab another one. It's not that easy. That's probably where it started from. And then the other part of it is just like, it's cool to see those kids. And you know, when you like, you ask them, they don't even know what to say. They, most of them just freeze. Like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, and then you have to explain to them, like, make sure you close the bag when you put the fish in so it doesn't jump out. It almost cost me at Santee this year. Five really? pounder about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Five pounder jumped straight out the bag, hit the sidewall of the boat, and went back down. Oh, yeah. It was oh, close. Was that with a kid helping you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Don't ever ask uh, that kid again. His, his get his out of here. His dad was so nervous. <laughs> I was like. What, and like Tiff and Kyle were nervous. And like, <laughs> whatever. Like, it's not a big deal. We're good. Uh, it, it's, I think it's one of the coolest things. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. I know you as a person and as a friend and as an angler, but I think what means more to you is that you make an impact in and, yeah. and I, and I think you do, dude, like, I think you, you're just getting started. Like, that's a scary thing to me. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I would say I, I feel like I'm fishing better now than I have in the past. Yeah. And I feel like every year I, I get a little bit better, right? Like you, those decisions come a little bit easier when to stay, when to go, you, you second guess those decisions a little bit less because that, you know, I mean, 12 years on the elites, like that's a lot of time on the water. Yeah. And, uh, the more time you get those decisions, right. then obviously the less you start to second guess them. So you just continually get better and better and better. I'm going to ask you a weird question. Um, Ooh, yeah, this Please. is weird because this week we I do this little show called The Call with Panger where we debate sport fishing topics on a weekly basis. And this week's show is um, who will end up with more Angler of the Year titles? Brandon Polnick, who's a two-time Angler of the Year, or Jacob Wheeler, who just became a two-time Angler of the Year. What say you, BP? I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's a right answer for that. There isn't. That's actually what I answered. The, uh, because we are both equally competitive. Uh, um, and so I don't know that like, there's not something you can say, Oh, well, if he does this, like he's going to win more. Yeah. I mean, it's not, uh, I don't know what he's done is incredible. I remember I met him actually at the Skeeter factory before he even won the all American. Really? 
Yeah, I don't know how old he was then. Seventeen, maybe. He came down with a dealer, uh, and I just happened to be there picking up one of my first boats, and he was there. But I mean, man, he there's no doubt he can catch a bass, and so I think it would be cool to see. I mean, he won back to back, so. Well, you, you, you're set up to go. I mean, you got to win. the. I mean, <laughs> you got to win one to win two, right? You got to win two to win three. Um, I mean, I think it'd be fun if like we just continually battle out to see who can win more AOIs. You know, like that's just one more competitive thing to have in the back of your pocket. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's a stupid we'll question to 10. ask you. I mean, how can you? How can how can anyone answer that? I mean, especially with Angler of the Year, like or anything. Like, I mean, it's just the the answer is that you're both going to be ultra competitive and you're both going to battle it out for a long time. And it's not just you two. There's a bunch of we. Oh, yeah, like, like we both may never win another one, and we both also may win five more. You know, <laughs> like those are both possibilities. Well. We'll see how it all works out. The future will tell. But um, this has been a much different chat than I expect. Like very deep, and and yeah. but that's also like the side of you that I don't think everybody realizes how thought out you are. And and I appreciate you sharing that with me here on our silly little show. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, good show. Pretty oh, good show. thanks. You keep you keep growing. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll be at when this airs, we should be over 150,000 subscribers. It's freaking nuts. Weren't, I, you, weren't you just at 100 like two, two months, months ago? ago yeah. God, dude, Isn't that crazy. Like, it is it took you. It took you forever to get to that first 50,000. Yeah. And this last 50,000 happened in two months. Yeah. Well, like Angler of the Year titles, they can stop. We may make a million <laughs> or I may never make it to 150 because we're only at 149 and something right now. But um, I'm thinking, uh, we're gonna, I mean, this show alone should put us, put us past that last question yeah. I have for you. Right. What makes fishing the greatest sport on earth? Uh, the unknown, I would say, um, you know, that there's, it's probably the same thing that some would also want to consider it or why some people would want to consider it not a sport is that you can't just physically, like there's not a physical attribute that you can have that says like, oh, that guy's going to be a great bass angler. Come in all shapes and sizes all forms from all over the world. Uh, and, you know, there's guys that have been competitive that are six and a half feet tall. And there's dudes that have been competitive at five and a half feet tall and everywhere in between where that's not the case in a lot of other sports. Right. Yeah. And so there's this crazy amount of like mental fortitude that it takes, uh, and like it, to me, it's, it's something that's also in that same realm makes it accessible to everyone else, Yeah, you know, which is, is really cool. And then also in the same light makes it really difficult to consider it a sport, right? Because I can catch a 10 pounder on a lake. And a guy can make five casts that's never made a cast ever in his life can make five casts and catch a 10 pounder, you know? And so to do it consistently at the top level is what makes it a sport, makes it competitive. Uh, but I, I think that's one of the coolest things, right? Is that it, it is attainable to an extent for nearly everybody. It is, but you are not just everybody, dude. You're a very special, special person. And I consider myself Thanks. very lucky to consider you a close friend. And um, it's an honor to 
to call all your accomplishments on stage. And um, I plan to stick you're, around. You're pretty, you're really good at it. Whatever. It's because I'm bad at other crap. It's because I, you, I only talk because I can't do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's one of the funniest things. And I got to just say this and then we can get off here. One of <laughs> this happens every, every day, every elite event. We, we have a person backstage, right? You're the guy, you're the next guy to weigh in. There's someone uh -huh. at the top of the stairs that says, all right, come on. It's your turn. Uh -huh. Every time you start talking, they're like, come on. And I just stand there. Yeah. You're one and of like, the only ones that like, does it right. Hey, hey, hey. You're like, hey, co co come on, come on. I'm like, I'm not going to grab these fish, go stand backstage and just stand there with these fish out of water and wait until he's done. Cause I know what you're going to say <laughs> and how long it's going to take. And I know how to time it out where these people, they don't, you know, they don't know, um, like when they're volunteering. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, I'll go in a sec. I'm like, hey, come on, come on. Like they get nervous. Like I don't hear them. I'm like, no, I know it's my turn. <laughs> I'm just going to wait for a second. <laughs> but that's what I love about you, that you pay enough attention to know that there's a moment like an intro is supposed to work like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the person stand, like sometimes like, you know, who's horrible at it. Hackney is the worst. I'm going to call him out right now because I mean, he's got a lot of accomplishments and I mean, I get it. First couple of days, whatever, yeah. come up, whenever we were firing through, but what did you, you're fishing on Sunday? I mean, you try to give the guy a big intro and I'm like, not even, halfway through his stuff and he's like standing beside me and i'm just like uh oh, well from gonzalez greg hackney but there is yeah. timing and you you know how to hit it so i appreciate yeah. that it's funny because you know Cheers, that man. volunteer has lisa going keep them coming because i mean yeah. we kill a lot of time in that little stretch if people don't get up on time you know what i mean yeah um for sure but you're, you're doing it right, um, I think. So uh, I, just, I, I thought that's funny because you don't get to see that part because you're busy out there entertaining. <laughs> well, I figured I'd share that. When Lisa first started, um, she said that to me once. She's like, well, Brandon, I mean, he waits. He doesn't, he doesn't come. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because he's a professional. He knows what yeah. he's doing. <laughs> Sometimes I time it wrong and, I'm, and I am standing back there. I'm like, this is awkward. <laughs> like I'm just standing back here where no one can see me waiting for him to say two more words. <laughs> well, it's going to be even more awkward next year. Cause it's going to be even longer. If you keep accomplishing things, I mean, we're going to have to take away, like they'll have to, I don't know. We'll figure out a way to get through it. Well, there's really only one more thing to accomplish. You know, everything else you just add it, you just change the number. Yeah. But this year you got to be reigning and defending. I mean, that gets added. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, go win the classic. I mean, yeah. do you, would you rather win another angler of the year or a classic? Uh, man, I think I would, I would want to win another AOI. Uh, really? Yeah. I don't know that I would have said that a few years ago, but. I don't know. I did. I think I just, it's so hard to yeah. win like nine well, events. Yeah. I mean, they're both incredibly hard to win and I've been close to the classic. Um, but I don't, I guess maybe because I know what the feeling of winning AOI feels like, and I don't know what the classic win feels like. I know what second feels like, and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I guess like maybe I just I don't know what that feeling is. I know I get choked up every time I watch somebody win it. Yeah, yeah. Every time I sit in the stand, like in the stands, and I see somebody win it, I get choked up because yeah. I imagine myself standing there holding that trophy. It's a it's a special moment, but I, I'm I'm gonna say I believe you'll win both of those again. I think you will win yeah. another Angler of the Year. I think you'll win a Bassmaster Classic. Um, but I want some uh, gold confetti. Yeah, <laughs> let's get some confetti. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, you don't well, get that if you win a classic. You don't get confetti if you win AOI. You only get confetti if you win the classic. All right. So confetti, that's what you want. Yeah. But you said you wanted oh. AOI. I know. You want but, it all. But I really I do. You're right. You really do. You really do. Selfish. Brandon Paulnick, thank you very much. This has been uh, well, a lot of fun. And um, the only thing to make it better is if a Sasquatch walk right past. <laughs> like literally just so <laughs> we'll try to see if one of our crack editors can make that happen. But I appreciate uh, you doing this. We're recording this the week before it's being released. And there's a Kansas City Chiefs game coming up in a few minutes. So I got to go. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. You're... Uh, I don't I was going to give you a big intro to end it. I've got nothing. Go yeah. find a Sasquatch and um, thanks, buddy. You're the best. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. See you, dude. There is only one Brandon Polnick. I mean, an amazing, amazing angler, an amazing human being, an amazing husband, an amazing father, and an amazing friend. Somebody I'm proud to call a friend and um, it is awesome to just watch his career go from the kid that I met in a coffee shop to what he is today which which is one of the most accomplished anglers of our time and literally a thought leader his thoughts and what I mean by that and that's a cool term isn't it I just came up with it I don't know if it's been used before but he's a thought leader his thoughts transcend him the way he looks at things, the way he thinks of things has a big impact on many, many anglers. Um, and, and the cool thing about him is I say this to him all the time, and I'm sure I said it a few times during our chat. I'm older than him. I'm supposed to be the one giving him the advice, but quite often I find uh, his way of looking at things and his way of, of looking at things not just for him – but looking at him at things for the betterment of the group is really amazing. And um, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, not just for being on this show, but thank you for being you. And uh, don't ever change. And I, and I, I don't think he will. But um, while we're at the thanks, thank you guys for watching each and every week. And uh, thank you for continuing to blow up this channel. So um, keep the grow going. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies, whoever you want. Get them on over here. Tell them to like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff so this becomes a success. And I can pay this next guy the absorbent funds. Not really. That I pay him. Take it away, Uncle Bob. The one and only Bob Cobb. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to, you hear?